Mark Cuban, the multi multi-millionaire investor who owns the Dallas Mavericks. He wrote, the tragedy of SVB is that it's not the wealthy taking the hit. It's the thousands of companies who borrowed from SVB and were required to keep their cash in SVB. Or former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, or the hedge fund manager, Bill Ackman. And they're all saying basically that if these Silicon Valley customers don't get made whole, everything is gonna descend into chaos. The financial system is going to stop functioning. Regular people are gonna lose trust in banks and pull their money out. Other banks are gonna fail. I mean, they are painting a really grim picture. So by the time Sunday rolls around, the question also is how is the government going to respond to the escalating panic that has been generated and stoked by these guys on social media? Mm -hmm. And the government basically decides to make Silicon Valley's depositors whole, even those who didn't have insurance on their deposits. And when you say make them whole? Meaning no matter how much money you had in a bank account at Silicon Valley Bank, which failed, you will get all of your money back. Mm, in other words, they make an exception to the normal FDIC cap of $250,000. That's right. It doesn't matter. You could have $2 million, you could have $20 million, you could have $500 million. You're getting your money back from this bank, however much you had in deposits there. So that's not all. The government takes over another bank, hmm. Signature Bank, is a regional lender based in New York. And the government said, in addition to making Silicon Valley bank customers whole, we're also going to make Signature Bank customers whole. And finally, the government announces that banks now have two ways to get almost instant cash from the Fed at almost no borrowing cost. And the message is this, banks, if you need cash, if your depositors want their money, come to us, we'll give you the cash. Just don't do what Silicon Valley Bank did and sell your assets at a fire sale and cause a panic. And this is what I think the Biden administration would say is the beauty of this program. Taxpayers are not paying for any of this. Hmm. Making depositors whole actually requires the banks themselves as a group to shoulder the cost of. And the way they do that is kind of like a condo board or a co-op board assessing all of the residents of a building fees. You pay into a central pot and that pot of money goes toward fixing things. Banks all pay into a central fund and then when one of them fails, that's the money that's used to make depositors whole. And then later they're actually gonna have to recoup that and replenish the fund through special assessments of banks. And so how do federal regulators, how does the Biden administration end up justifying such unusual and aggressive actions really across this entire industry? What the government did was they invoked the possibility that these two banks posed systemic risk to the system. That is the concept whereby if one thing goes bad in the financial system, everything goes bad and it destabilizes everything and regular people can't do regular financial business. So the FDIC actually said on Sunday night that they were using a systemic risk exception to the $250,000 limit on deposit insurance to make the depositors at these two institutions whole. Mm -hmm. So I'm now wondering, did our government kind of get bullied into reaching that conclusion by that second camp you described, by these wealthy depositors and their allies in tech who have a lot at stake here and seem to deliberately fan the fear of a systemic risk that would require the kind of rescue the government just released. I think that is a really plausible explanation. When you look at the industry that was stamping its feet and trying to get this exception and prophesying doom and gloom if they didn't get it, 
These are the people whose job it is to take the biggest risk, to pick companies that are almost certain to fail. That's what the startup world is. It's investing in things that you know you could lose all of your money in. And even if it doesn't increase the risk appetite of a person who says, I want to go out and do all kinds of outrageous things with my money, it just might make more people careless. Emily, I'm struck by the fact that just five years ago, as you recounted earlier in this conversation, Silicon Valley Bank and its CEO led this charge to roll back regulations that might have required much greater government scrutiny of its finances and its risk taking. Are officials now looking back at that 2018 decision with any regret? I think that there is definitely a growing understanding that's being publicly voiced out there that the 2018 regulatory rollback may have created a problem that is beyond one bank. After the financial crisis, there was this idea that some banks were too big to fail, like JP Morgan, Citi, but those were the exception, and the rest of the banks actually still had room to fail. But what these last couple of days have shown us is that maybe there is less of a difference between the biggest banks and some of these less big banks. We're now in a world where whether it's caused by irrational fear or something else, the failure of just one of these smaller banks can threaten the entire system. And that's shocking and potentially very scary. Well, Emily, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you.
Good evening. We are returning to our evening session for March 14, 2023. The board held its open session at 3 today, followed by work session and closed session. Item K, certification resolution. In the closed session just concluded, nothing was discussed except the matter which was identified in the motion to convene in closed session. Only those matters lawfully permitted to be discussed under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act were discussed. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Motion to adopt. And a second? Second. And would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Peters? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Mr. Norworth? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Item L, public hearing and adoption of resolutions. Public hearing for citizen comments on the maximum 2023 calendar year tax rates for real estate, personal property, and machinery and tools. Taxes, Lori Gerhart, Director of Finance and Management Services. Welcome back. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. This item is to conduct a public hearing for citizen comment on the maximum 2023 calendar tax rates. The public hearing was advertised on February 28th and March 7th in the Roanoke Times, thereby satisfying state code requirements for public notice. Staff recommends conducting the public hearing to receive citizen comments on the maximum 2023 calendar tax rates. So thank you very much. At this time, we will open the public hearing. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up to speak for the public No, ma'am, we do not. I will close the public hearing. Item L2, resolutions to set the following maximum tax rates for calendar year 2023 to support the fiscal year 2023-2024 operating budget. Resolution to set the real estate maximum tax rate for calendar year 2023. Madam Chair, um, I move that we set the real estate maximum tax rate for calendar year 2023 at our current rate of $1.09 per $100 of assessed valuation. Um, I, I would want to emphasize to our citizens that this is merely a procedural process for purposes of a legal notice. Um, the, the board is in the middle of its budget deliberations. Uh, we're probably still another three weeks to a month away from concluding that. Um, we have yet to receive from the school board what uh, its budget request is. And if you listen to our meeting earlier this afternoon, uh, we're, we're contemplating maybe adding uh, almost $100 million of additional uh, borrowing and debt that will require um, a lot of uh, significant principal and interest payments. But I want to emphasize to the citizens that the board is, we've heard the comments, all of us have heard the comments from our citizens, the concerns about the real estate tax rate. Um, we will be looking at, in the future, at our meeting on, I believe, April 11th, uh, a reduction in the real estate tax rate. But right now, for purposes of a legal ad, um, I would recommend that we advertise at $1.09 per $100 of assessed valuation. Um, that allows us to, to kind of set the stage with some flexibility in the future based on uh, the conclusion of our, our budget deliberations over the next month. That's my motion, Madam Chair. Is there a second? I'll make a second. I'll second, Madam Chair, but I also have a question. So this is it's for calendar year 2023, but really, are we not talking about the fiscal year 24 that will start July 1? So, no. <clears throat> no. No. So when we adopt this tax rate, this tax rate will be applied to the bills that will go out on June 5th of this year. So the first half will Just actually the fiscal year mm -hmm, will okay. be in the current you. year, and then the second half will be December 5th, so it'll be in fiscal year 24. 24. Gotcha. Okay. I just wanted clarification. Thank, Thank you. you. So, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Peters? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Mr. North? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. 
And item B, resolution to set the personal property maximum tax rate for calendar year 2023. Are there any questions? Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Madam Chair, I make uh, the motion. Along the same discussion that Mr. Mahoney just made, uh, to keep it at what it, where it is right now at $3.50, again, meeting all the legal requirements uh, uh, at this point and give the staff time to complete their, their budget and also they're waiting to hear back uh, on what, they are, what the uh, used car values are going to do to our, to our citizens. So <clears throat> that is my resolution to keep it at $3.50. And again, uh, it may come back where we can lower that uh, when we do the effective rate uh, April the 11th. And uh, is there a second? Second. And would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Peters? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Mr. North? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Item C, resolution to set the machinery and tools tax maximum tax rate for calendar year 2023. Laurie Gearhart? Yes. Um, the current tax rate is $2.85 per $100 of assessed value. Uh, we did make the resolution at $2.80 per 100 assessed value, uh, but again, it's at the um, pleasure of the board on how they proceed to go forward. So could you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So our current tax rate for machinery and tools is $2.85 per 100 assessed value. However, the resolution that we've prepared reduced that by five cents and um, put it at two dollars and eighty cents per one hundred assessed value. Understood. How Understood. I understand. So, um, Mr. North, were you going to propose? Uh, Madam Chair, I make a motion we support the two dollars and eighty cents proposed by staff, hundred dollars of assessed valuation for machinery and tools for calendar year twenty twenty three. Said so it's no more than two dollars and eighty cents. And is there a second? Second. And would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Peters? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Mr. Norworth? Yes. Mr. Bradford? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. Item M, citizen comments and communications. Do we have any citizens who have signed up to speak? No, ma'am. Moving on, inquiries, reports and inquiries of board members. And going first tonight is Mr. Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just going to reiterate what you've already heard from a couple other board members that we are still in the budget process there there is a desire by the, the this board as a whole to uh, reduce taxes uh, but we're in the midst of trying to figure out exactly where everything's going to land so i know that we'll be working diligently over that over the next 30 <coughs> days to resolve that and to bring some relief to our citizens um i don't think i have anything else from the vinton district but uh yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. North. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, emphasize what others have, that we're going to be evaluating this closely with staff moving forward on the uh, personal property relief as well as on the uh, real estate uh, tax rate. And I'd also like to ask staff to let us know as soon as possible when we find that data out on personal property I know last year, I don't know if it was on time or late, but it was a rush on to get it done. So I hope that can be done in a efficient time manner this year. Uh, the only thing I have to share with you is I'm on the I-81 advisory uh, committee and uh, Delegate Austin, who's our chair of that committee, wrote to Secretary of Transportation uh, Shep Miller and said to Shep basically, look, uh, the budget hadn't passed yet. It's got $500,000 earmarked uh, to study I-81 corridor for uh, future improvements. So let's not wait. Let's go ahead and use VDOT resources and start uh, in the direction of a study. And I have to applaud uh, Chairman Austin of that committee for let's move ahead and not wait for the budget and in his instructions on March 1st to the Secretary of Transportation. So I-81 is an ongoing subject that will continue for many years beyond 2033 and the current funding to see what we can do to get it uh, 
in better shape sooner than later. Thank you. And that's all. That's all I have. Uh, Mr. Mahoney. Uh, two items, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, back on March 8th, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, attending the uh, meeting of the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy Committee, uh, the SEDS Committee. This is a committee of the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Regional Commission. We met up in, uh, up in Covington, up in Allegheny. Uh, it was uh, a very good meeting, uh, well, well attended. And, and Allegheny County and Covington folks talked about some exciting cooperative actions they've been taking uh, with uh, some EDA grants that they've achieved for some of their uh, trails up there. And so I think we had a good meeting. Uh, the second item I'd like to talk about, and I'd, I'd ask the indulgence of the board, um, I'd ask you to uh, perhaps agree to amend our agenda what I'd like to do is, in amending the agenda, I'd like the board to consider the adoption of a resolution asking the Roanoke County Planning Commission to study and provide some recommendations to us whether or not to amend the industrial use types in our, in our uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, those provisions are defined in 30-29-6 of the county code. Um, I guess my concern is, is that if you look at the county code, uh, those provisions were probably adopted in 1992, early 1990s. And, and I think uh, they, they ought to be amended to reflect what the current economy is like in terms of the new technologies that are out there in industrial, in industrial zone classifications. So if it would be the pleasure of the board, I'd, First of all, I'd like to see if the board would unanimously agree to amend our agenda, and then secondly, to uh, adopt the resolution to ask our planning commission to look at this, look at amending our industrial use types under our zoning ordinance. So are you all right so, with proceeding yes. with this amendment? Yes. Do, do we need to amend it, or can we not just give direction to the planning commission? I think we need a resolution okay. uh, under the state code. We need a resolution from us to go to the planning commission, okay. I'm asking them it. to look at that. Yes, sir. I'm good. So, and go forward with a motion to approve this resolution. Yes. And is there a second? Second. And would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Peters? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Mr. North? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for indulging us, Debbie. <laughs> is there anything else? No. no. That's no, it? Okay. And then moving on to Mr. Radford. Uh, yes. Uh, I just want to report uh, that last night we were at uh, Bent Mountain doing the Runnock County 200 plan. Uh, we also did this at Hidden Valley High School last week. Uh, turnout in Bent Mountain uh, was probably our largest so far, 93 participants. Uh, I mean, I could have stayed longer uh, and chatted with those people. It's They're really... Uh, interested in their community and what we've got planned. Uh, it's you know, just good talking to all those people. Hidden, at Hidden Valley High School, I uh, knew quite a few people there. Uh, a smaller crowd uh, at the high school, uh, but still uh, you know, attended uh, by people in there. Anyway, look forward to, appreciate the, the county staff, uh, Alex presenting that along with Megan on the transportation side. And uh, it looks like everybody look forward to, citizens look forward to that moving on uh, through the next process. I know we have another one this week, I think, uh, mm -hmm. at South County Library. So, tomorrow uh, night. Tomorrow night, yeah. So <clears throat> thank you, staff. That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, I have just a couple of comments before um, we move on to adjournment. But um, I want to just offer a few notes of appreciation for my fellow board members. We had some pretty dynamic conversation tonight uh, dealing with um, the MOU for the schools, and um, I, I really appreciated the input, and I hope that the public uh, understands some of the deliberation and what all is involved in coming forward with uh, these types of, of issues. Um, and then with the maximum tax rates that we sat tonight, I want to make sure, too, that the citizens um, 
know that we hear you. We've all had a lot of phone calls and uh, concerned with some assessments and things. Uh, uh, we know that um, the needs of the county continue to increase and are expensive, and uh, it's it's increasingly difficult for some of our citizens and some of our residents. So. Um, but this board has heard you, and um, and we're, we'll go forward very sensitive to our next steps. Uh, with that being said, I'd like to make some uh, further announcements regarding the uh, draft Roanoke County 200 plan reveal meetings. I was asked to go through and just summarize real quickly, and, and Dave actually did a really great job. But just a reminder that if you have not attended one of those meetings yet, that there are still two available so far, we've completed meetings and have had over 240 in attendance, which I think is really great. That was a, a great attendance by our, our citizens. We met with Catawba, Glenver, and Mason's Cove on February 7th, uh, Peters Creek, March 1, Bonsack, Venton, and Mount Pleasant on March 6th, Windsor Hills, March 8th. Back Crete and Bent Mountain on March 13, and now we still have two more. And so, if you can attend these, it would really be uh, great. We really appreciate the input we're getting. Cave Spring and Clearbrook community planning areas are meeting tomorrow evening, uh, March 15th, at the South County Library Auditorium. It's an open house format beginning at 4.30 and ending at 6.30. There will be a fairly short presentation at 5, and I believe Alex Jones has been the one that has made those presentations. Um, and then on, um, let's see, March 23rd will be the Planning Commission public hearing option number one on March 23rd at the Green Ridge Rec Center meeting room at 5 p.m. So there's still quite a bit to, um, to uh, listen and to give your feedback if you're so inclined. So thank you for the patience of staff and, um, and I'm open to a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. And a second? Second. And would the clerk please call the roll. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Mr. North? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Thank you very much. We are adjourned. We're talking about the fight to control the St. Louis Police Department. The St. Louis, uh, excuse me, the M Missouri legislature wants to take back control of the St. Louis PD. When we come back, we're going to hear from the current mayor of St. Louis and also from a Missouri state senator as well. So, Tony Messenger, stand by. It'll be just a minute. This is On Point.